Hi, my name is McKenna Chan. And I'm Kyle Spittler. And today we're going to explore sea star wasting disease. Some symptoms of this marine disease include limb autonomy, deterioration of body structure, and death. Recently, there was an outbreak in 2014, which resulted in the death of most sea star populations along the West Coast. While watching a sea star's arm walk away from its body is interesting to watch, this disease is important to address and learn about. Sea stars serve as a keystone species and are incredibly important to the intertidal ecosystem. In this video, we're going to explore potential causes of sea star wasting, why sea stars are important, what researchers think, and potential for resistance and recovery. First, let's take a look at the stages of disease in sea star wasting. In the field, researchers use categories of disease to identify and collect data to determine the health of sea stars in the ecosystem. Category one includes white lesions on one arm or lesions on its body. Category two is lesions on two arms or on one arm and some on its body. Category three is when there are lesions all over a sea star's body and it's missing one to two of its arms. Lastly, category four is the more, most severe with tissue deterioration and it's missing more than three of its arms. We can see that sea star wasting disease is pretty brutal, so what do researchers think caused this deadly disease? Researchers have yet to find a specific cause for this disease, but there has been evidence for a variety of reasons that can contribute to the sea star wasting. One possibility is viruses. Researchers found that there is a wasting asteroid associated densovirus related to sea star wasting disease. However, this virus was only found to cause wasting in the sunflower sea star. Sea star wasting disease is unlikely to be related to any singular pathogen except for in the case of the sunflower sea star. In one study, researchers found that there were differences in the microbiome between sick and healthy sea stars. As the disease progressed, known beneficial bacteria decreased, while a known pathogenic and opportunistic bacteria increased in abundance during the early and late stages of disease. Researchers in this study think that the changes in a sea star's microbiome and the imbalance could lead to a sea star's wasting disease or it is a consequence of infection from another pathogen. Another possible cause for sea star wasting are the effects of temperature. For an ochre sea star at higher temperatures, they are at, risk for, they're at higher risk for infection. Warmer temperatures can also suppress a species' immune response, making them more susceptible. In addition to this, warm temperatures could also increase the pathogen's proliferation. Implications for temperature are especially relevant today in the light of the climate crisis and global warming. So in order to understand the significance of this, this, this disease, I guess we have to ask, why are sea stars within the rocky intertidal important, or are they even important for the surrounding ecosystem at all? Well, the answer is yes. They are actually one of the most important species within the rocky intertidal. Sea stars within the rocky intertidal act as keystone species. And if you're unfamiliar with a keystone species, this is a species that has a disproportionately large effect on its natural environment relative to its population abundance. So the sea star is not the most numerous creature within the intertidal, but its interactions with the other species there help balance and shape its ecosystem. For example, Sea stars within the rocky intertidal play a big role in the distribution of mussels throughout the area. Mussels create large beds and densely compact on rock surfaces, leaving little room for other anchoring species like barnacles or clams. Through predation of these mussels, sea stars are able to make way for larger diversities of species and maintain the balance of populations. Interestingly, as these sea star populations have struggled to rebound since the onset of wasting disease, scientists have seen the advancement of the mussel beds across the rocky intertidal to cover larger areas. This has negatively affected the diversity of rock clinging algal species and other species as well. One individual we spoke to in order to get a more clear picture of wasting disease is Dr. Lauren Schiebelholt. She's a geneticist from UC Merced and is currently researching at UC Davis. Her research has identified interesting impacts within sea stars genes that activate in response to the presence of the wasting disease. She's happy, 
She happened to be researching population dynamics around 2015, which was the year before the wasting disease infected a majority of the sea stars on the Pacific Coast Rocky Intertidal. The next year in 2016, she conducted a genetic analysis of some sea stars that seemed to resist the wasting disease apart from those infected. What she found was that the resistant sea stars activate a set of genetic responses to help them adapt to the stress of the disease. One interesting observation she made was the increase in sea star recruitment the year sea star wasting disease impacted many populations. To explain recruitment briefly, it's the process by which new individuals are added to a population, whether by birth, maturation, or immigration. During Dr. Schiebelholt's population survey in 2016, she observed many juvenile starfish, indicating a large uptake in recruitment had occurred. When we asked if she had any idea why, she speculated that the stress of the disease most likely promoted the production of a high number of offspring for increased chances for spreading and survival of the sea star populations. When analyzing the genes of the recruits versus the sick and resistant adult sea stars in the rocky intertidal, she observed that the recruits were genetically similar to the resistant sea stars, indicating that the stress of the disease was promoting the genetic response in the parental and offspring generations. This increase in genetic resistant recruits in 2016 provided much hope to scientists that these potentially genetically superior sea stars would be able to persist and rebound populations to their normal level. Although research is still being conducted, Preliminary findings have shown that sea star populations have rebounded in recent years. This rebound has occurred in areas along California, Oregon, and Canada's coasts. However, one interesting thing scientists observed is this recovery is not consistent across space or time, as there seems to be no identifiable trend or correlation to why these populations seem to be able to rebound in certain areas along the coast and not others. In some areas, there still exists high populations of diseased sea stars. This scattered recovery has led scientists to piece more parts of this largely, largely unknown disease together. For example, scientists have suggested that the existing pathology of the disease within sea stars is a side effect to a much larger process of eutrophication in some areas. To explain eutrophication briefly, increased nutrients from surface water runoff enter the oceans and promote algae growth. This uptake in growth increases the rate of algae die-off and sinks to the ocean floor. As the dead matter sinks, it is decomposed by microbes that use up all the oxygen in the area. Some scientists believe that the process of dead material sinking to the bottom of the ocean and potentially covering the sea stars promotes microbial decomposition on the sea star itself, which suffocates the sea star, hindering its ability to absorb oxygen from the water. Establishing the validity of this hypothesis remains to be seen as many sea star populations still remain susceptible, but as you can see, the recovery of sea stars is just as important for unraveling the mystery of the disease as the investigation into the disease itself is. So currently, as we stand in 2020, scientists are tasked with multiple paths forward for understanding the disease. While the cause of sea star wasting disease is still vague and complex, Scientists are getting closer and closer to understanding and piecing together the bigger picture of the disease in order to help potentially prevent future waves of the disease from hitting these sea stars. And most importantly, I think scientists are able to understand the resilience of sea stars as well. Even though the disease has brought about much concern for the overall well being of the ecosystems, it has also allowed scientists to understand further the dynamics and importance of sea stars within the rocky intertidal that couldn't have been achieved experimentally. For example, the case of sea star wasting disease and these sea stars is one of the best examples of natural selection and ad adaptation within a species to survive. Scientists have learned an incredible amount about this species that couldn't have been achieved without the disease. So in a sense, there has been a tremendous accomplishment that has come from this disease that has been and still seems very unknown. And Lastly, we would like to uh, thank everyone that helped us put this presentation together. We'd like to thank Dr. Lauren Schiebelholt for taking the time to offer her insight and um, interview and offer time for us to get her findings. And 
understand more deeply what this disease is. Uh, we'd also like to thank Dr. Ritson Williams for a great quarter. Um, this has been an unexpected kind of time and we appreciate his marine ecology course. And we would also like to thank you for taking the time to listen to our presentation. And of course, none of this would be possible without the numerous research resources provided by Santa Clara University. Thank you. Thank you.